Lancasters and Bolingbrooks. Offer guidance, no matter how well it is received. Return to claim your birthright. And seriously, I need you to tell me, does this crown and scepter make me look like a slut? Ah, it's time to talk tall to me. Because I really want to look like a slut. <laughs> oh, that's... I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Is that the look you were going for? Uh, is there a sluttier crown? Or is um, this the one that you have? The, the one that goes on your genitals. We'll, we'll fetch that from, from the, the, the storage. Welcome back. I am Omen Thomas Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together, we are that perfect union, feckless momes. And this is the bastard offspring that is Talk Tall to Me. A long sentence in the prison of Prague Rock in which Nick of Norfolk and, oh my god, not the French again, Omen, will people this little world with our thoughts on every single track that rifle ruling rock band Jethro Tull has ever had the nobility to leash upon our dreary world. We will bear the misfortunes of Aqualung upon our backs. We shall read the Rolling Stone reviews, though they are clamorous groans which strike upon our hearts. And we will not vex the soul of Ronnie Pilgrim, since presently his soul must part his body. And through a series of fluteful maneuvers, we will reinstate the true heir to the throne of rock. That's right. We will anoint him and take him to Crown Town. It's the King of Prague, Ian Anderson. Wearing nothing but a cod piece, he kneels, and a and a flute is is tapped upon both shoulder. That's right. Rise, Sir Anderson. Nick, Omen, welcome back. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year! First episode of the new year. Very exciting. And I have high hopes for 2023. Oh my gosh, we're set to see a new album that is coming out in the spring. Yeah, we are. As of right now, we don't know anything other than that. Um, what's the... Did they push back Broadsword to 24? Or is it just later 23? I don't remember. Regardless, whenever it comes out, we won't be doing it in 2023. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> I forget what was what. I know that there was a book that was delayed because of printing in some part of the world. But, you know, time is like an ocean. It has its tides. It's had. It has its waves. And we are but... Like a wee little boat upon its surface, fishing for tall fish. Das Boot. <laughs> you should save that. Nick, um, today we are more adrift than usual because we are actually in the interstitial album material. We are between albums. That's right. We are in liminal space here, even mm -hmm. more bizarre than the Christmas album. I found this track, which was produced in 1986, and I decided to drop it here because the next album proper that we will be doing is Crest of a Knave from 1987. Which is very exciting. Which is very exciting, but I wanted to drop this in chronologically, so here's a little bit of a wild card for you. And so, with all of that, I hope that all of you chrononauts are ready to take a listen to... Corona. Put on your time goggles. <laughs> Let's have a listen. <laughs> Nick, that was Corona. Goodness me, was that Corona. Was that the first time you heard that? Or did you give it a preliminary listen? I did give it a preliminary listen earlier today, but my reaction is still the same to it. You gave it a promiscuous listen? I promiscuously listened to it, yeah. You wore a very short skirt. I was not well dressed to listen to it because it gave me such chills and goosebumps across my body that I, it was really, really a visceral reaction. If, if I had reacted any more strongly to it, I would have had to have seen... <laughs> The joke is so good, if only I could think of the word. <laughs> this joke is going to be great. Just, <laughs> you wait for it. It's going to be amazing. Not a dietitian. An allergist. <laughs> Come back next week, folks. For the punchline. <laughs> Send us a mail, and we will mail you the punchline. <laughs> Snail mail only. Seriously, that song is, is incredible to me, and I cannot can wait to unpack it yeah because there is so much going on on every level and what a treat nick you know this is one that i never 
would have found on my own accord, I think, had you not forced me into listening to it. So it was a random buried bonus track on like a 20th anniversary or something somewhere. And it was written for a British Channel 4 TV program called The Blood of the British. No, oh, okay. Yep, yep. That makes sense. An eight-part history series. And it was, it was basically like a, a glimpse at history and a glimpse at like mm -hmm. why you should be proud of your homeland, etc. The original short version of Coronach was written for that by D. Palmer, our mm -hmm. sweet, sweet D. And then it was later re-recorded in 86. And this is the, the version that we're listening to here. Fantastic. So to to go to follow the thread of D, I went to look up the lyrics to this song in Silent Singing. Okay. And I I do that through searching the PDF uh, format of the book. Yes. And to my surprise, no lyrics came up. Is it because you couldn't spell Koronok? You know, normally it would be, but <laughs> I actually made sure that I had the correct spelling. The mm. reason is because it's not in there. Mm. However, what I did find on page nine of the introduction to the book, these lines written by Ian Anderson. No means of listing, however, can be perfect. Three songs where the lyrics were written by another band member, Mick Abrams' Move On Alone and Dee Palmer's Coronach and Urban Apocalypse are not included here. No offense intended to them, but my responsibility is only for my own work here. Their words and music are, are entirely their own, and you will find the lyrics online. It's such an odd choice. It makes sense to me. It makes sense. But it's, it's only three songs. If there were, like, two dozen, I would understand. He goes on to say, However, some words by Jeffrey Hammond are included here in the lyrics and annotated as such th since they were integral to the other materials in those songs and I was involved in the context and realization. I think what I'm getting the sense of is that Ian doesn't feel a sense of ownership yeah. over Move On Alone, Karnach, and Urban Apocalypse. Understandable. And I think the ones with Jeffrey are what? Like... Uh, passion play, right? Like, didn't he write that? And he who... wrote a section, yeah. yeah, where it was a section of the greater work. Which you could not pull that out. You could not say, oh yeah, by the way, go find the hair who lost his spectacles online. I'm going to not <laughs> include part of this song. Yeah. I'm going to include every... He included the word the, which will not be published here. I didn't want the, but he convinced me of it. It's struck from the record. So... All vowels have been removed. <laughs> Omen, what is... What is a Koronach? I'm so glad you asked me, because that reminds me to ask you, Nick, mm. what is a Koronach? So this is something that we have seen. Is it a small boat? No, that's a coracle? Oh, wow. Yeah, nice. Is that a coracle? That is a coracle, yeah. Oh, nice. No, it is. Uh, we're, we've seen this a couple of times where Ian names a song after a song type, i.e. Pebroke. Or Pavane. Or Pavane, yeah. Oh, no, the Pavane's a dance, isn't it? Well, it's, still, it's still a type of music. It okay, is a specific form of music. Fair enough. But a Coronach is a Scottish Gaelic equivalent of the Gaul, G-O-L-L, -L, being the third part of a round of keening, which is the traditional improvised singing at a death, wake, or funeral in the highlands of Scotland and in Ireland. Wow. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about keening before. I believe we have, yeah. To my understanding, it is a traditional form of mourning that involves making this incredible sound while rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's part one of the keening. I'm not sure. It reminds me a little bit of the traditional way of mourning in Klingon culture, where when a Klingon loses a loved one, they let loose a blood-curdling scream to help guide the departed soul to... Stovokor. Wow. Yeah, that sounds right for Klingon. I, I hate to stereotype, but it's, it sounds it sounds right for Klingon. I am very embarrassed by the fact that it took me less time to think of Stovokor than it did allergists. <laughs> <laughs> have you been watching Star Trek no. recently? Oh. No. <laughs> no. I have not. But that is more... Has more of, of an effect on my life. It's more appropriate in your life than an allergist is. I mean, I get it. Yeah. So... It seems as though 
what Ian is saying by naming, or perhaps what Dee is saying by naming the song Koronok, uh-huh. is that the song itself is a is a mourning is mourning something. It's a lament. Yeah, that's that's an interesting choice given the context of it is for it was written for a British program, not Scottish mm-hmm. or Irish, about like showing the the magic and the pride of Britain. You know, the history of Britain. Well, I think that a very, and we will get more into this with the second half of the program, but I believe that there is a very specific reference being made with the text of the song, and I am excited to talk about that in the second half. But before we get there, I do wonder if that line that Ian sings, or that vocal line, He already wrote, he already wrote, Hioranio yeah. is perhaps meant to resemble or is a reference to that improvised traditional singing. Yeah. The only thing I saw was like on a Tull forum somewhere, somebody said like it's a Gaelic battle cry. It would make a lot more sense to be a keening though. Well, maybe it's maybe it is something. Maybe it is a word in Gaelic, or or you know, a lot of languages have non-words. Yeah, there. I know Greek is full of them. There's all. There's like a whole list of of sounds that have specific meanings or specific are used in specific situations, which are not words. Yeah, but have meaning. Yeah, they have an intention behind them. And I would not be shocked to hear that Gaelic was chock full of that sort of thing. I mean, the example of acht. Mm, yeah, right, right. Not a word. But it's, it is, it's not an expletive per se, but it's a, something you insert in there to, to hammer a point, to react to something. Sure, yeah. yeah. So uh, more importantly, I think, is we should talk about the town named Coronach in Saskatchewan. Oh my God. <laughs> Christmas has come early. <laughs> tell me more about this town in Saskatchewan, Nick. No, I have, n- I have nothing about it. I just wanted to tell you that there's a town in Saskatchewan. Is it very big? I have no idea. I didn't look it up. I just know that it's a town in Saskatchewan. Damn it. Now I have to look it up. Now you've piqued my curiosity. This is not the tangent I wanted to go down. Is there a different tangent? The tangent of the music. <laughs> it is not a very big town, Nick. Tiny town. The most remarkable thing in it from a quick Googling is revealed to be Big Muddy Outlaw Cave Tours. Hey, that sounds actually very bizarre and strange. I'm not sure I would do that. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about the music. When you think back after having just listened to it, what's the first sound that you remember with this song? Oboe. Yeah. Yeah. Is it oboe or is it clarinet? I am... I'm wishing that it is an oboe, and I think it is. Okay. It just feels a little high for oboe, but... Oh, oboe is, is... I think you're thinking of the bassoon. Well, bassoon is low, low. We hear the bassoon later on, but it goes bassoon, oboe, clarinet. Clarinet's high, high. I think oboe and clarinet are switched. Incorrect. Is that not true? Am I wrong? It's never happened before. What an <laughs> unusual feeling. <laughs> you That you've been wrong? Yeah. <laughs> That's the first time for everything. I think this is an oboe because it has that double reed sound. I think if it was a clarinet, it would sound a little bit more mellow. Yeah, the clarinet extends a full octave above the oboe. I'm going to show you something that extends a full octave. Above the oboe? (laughs) Above the elbow, sorry. The elbow. (laughs) Yes, above the elbow. (laughs) I'm standing by my my thought that it is an oboe. Well, if you think that the oboe is higher, then yes, it would be the oboe, which therefore, by the transitive property, the higher instrument is the clarinet, and I am therefore correct. I'm going. I'm going away from the. <laughs> I'm going away from the scale. No, it's more the 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 tone, the quality okay. of, of sound. Okay, it has that double read. When I first listened to this song, I thought, "Wow, that really sounds like D. Palmer, like the whole orchestration." So I'm sure does. I'm very vilified. Nope, vindicated <laughs> to find out that she wrote it. Presumably both the words and the music. Yes, that's my assumption. We have the clarinet. There's those gorgeous harps, harp yes. strings in the beginning. Yeah. 
and the strings come in. As soon as I heard the harp, let alone the strings later on, it's it's D. It's totally D. Blessed the land that would be born within this green and pleasant land. And whether it's a clarinet or an oboe, when have we heard either of those instruments in Tull? Correct, yeah. Technically, is this a Tull song? I would say it is. You know, I mean, just because Ian Anderson and the Jethro Tull Band played it, Dee Palmer wrote it, and it wasn't for an album. We're getting in muddy territory here. We're getting into big muddy and outlaw cave exploration <laughs> territory here. Stop the podcast. We'll pick it up when we get to the caves. I think that this falls into the category of maybe... There's certain Shakespeare plays where where they say, okay, this one is pure Shakespeare. We've we've run it through algorithms. We've had scholars study it over and over and over again. Every single word here was penned by William Shakespeare. And there are other plays where it's like, well, a lot of it's Shakespeare, and some of it probably was written by somebody else a uh, hundred years later. Yeah, right. And there's some of it that's like, well, this seems more like a collaboration between Shakespeare and somebody else. Yeah. And I love all of them. It's Shakespeare featuring F.T. Marlowe. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. I'm, I've never been so excited about a comparison to modern music <laughs> and Shakespeare, but no, that's exactly right. But credit was not given in the same way that it is now. Then. Right, yeah. This feels like kind of the Pericles of the Tull universe. In that it's, it's a D. Palmer joint with contributions by Jethro Tull? I take it back. This is the double falsehood of the Tull universe. It's questionable at best. <laughs> questionable at best. Written by someone else. Definitely has some Shakespeare in there. Yeah. But that's as far as we're willing to go. Yeah, okay. I like it. But Double Falsehood is a magnificent piece of drama. It's a magnificent script, and this is a magnificent song. So I kind of I kind of don't care what its providence is. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you've seen me eat food off the ground. You've seen me eat food off the ground. I've seen, I've put food on the ground and watched you eat it. <laughs> we have both fought over food that was on the ground. <laughs> we're doing better now. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Now we, we at least put our plates on the ground and then eat. That's right. And the reason, the reason it, it is tullish to me is because, you know, we start out with this very deep Palmer, oboe harp, very light drums, mm -hmm. almost like a mystical feel. I can imagine it would, it was fantastic in the program for which it was written, but at the end, once Ian is done singing all the Hiorani Rose, we have Martin come here in. We have the drums drop, and we have an incredible hard prog rock outro to the song. Yeah, at about two, two and a half minutes, it, it rips in, and that sounds like Tull to me. Heavy Tull. Yes, absolutely. But also setting up that harder rock sound with the more gentle, more composed things, I love it. I think it's a brilliant balance of music, and I've been missing some of that composition. Yeah. That more traditional composition in my life. Yeah, I agree. Under wraps was great. I'm glad we went through it, but I do miss some of that older tull, and I know we're going we're getting further and further away from that older tull, but we're getting into we're veering away from the really experimental and going back into a little more traditional. We're going back into a more composed couple of albums here, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that that hard rock, that's heavy for Martin, it feels like. Yeah, and it's great. And we hear him we He's teased a little bit earlier on in the song, uh huh, and yeah. which is delightful. A little scrow in the background. With the wind from the east came the first of those that tread. And this is the year before Crest comes out. And Crest is the one that won the heavy, the best heavy metal album, beating 
Jane's Addiction and Metallica. Metallica, yeah, yeah, yeah. That big kerfuffle. Yeah. So that sound, or I mean, I guess the idea of that sound is is not far away. So that actually brings up a question. Who do you think the personnel are on this album? Obviously, we have Ian. Obviously, we have Martin, very recognizable. Obviously, D is all over this. Who else would be in the right time frame? In 86? Let's see, 86. We have this weird transition, but I don't think, aside from PJV not being in the band, I don't think we had too much change here. We've obviously got Ian, Martin, Dave Pegg is still in it from Under Wraps into Crest, so oh, he was really? a part of the band. Yep. Oh, okay, interesting. And then who was drummer on... Um, Oh, there was no drummer. Ha, <laughs> silly me. That, that was not setting up a joke. I, I literally forgot. <laughs> but in, in Crest, we have the, the drumming is split up a little bit. Jerry Conway is back for half of the tracks. And then Don Perry steps in for two and seven. And I think Don Perry takes over after that. So this could have been either one of them on, on this track, or it could be a third unknown drummer. Yeah, the unknown drummer. His grave. The grave of the unknown drummer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always leave out a half-finished beer for him. It's hard to really know, but, I mean, I can't imagine for the rock portion of it, they would have gone with, just pulled someone in if Tull, the Tull experience, was these artists. And it definitely is not Drumatron. That's literally exactly what I was just about to say. There is feeling there. It doesn't sound synthesized. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say musically? Oh, gosh, let me see. So, yeah, the flute is nice, the layers of the voice. I really love the Hio Ranio. Some harmony there with Ian yep. doubling up on himself. We get a really cool marching snare at about 115, 130. Hio Ranio. And that's when it really starts to, the, the kind of the momentum starts to roll in to get really heavy. We get some bass and electric at about two. With the wind from the east came the first of those that tread upon the sun, this throne of kings, this round this new Jerusalem. It takes two really great aspects of Tull, if there was like the D portion and then an Ian acoustic instrumental and then Martin kicked in, it would be the perfect Tull song. It is as close to perfect. It's as close to absolute zero as we're going to get. Yeah, it's pretty darn good. I yeah. really like it. It genuinely makes my hair stand on end. Yeah, just the one though. Just the single one. Yeah, I have to stay out of the storms. Nothing more for me. Shall we go halfway? Let's go all the way. <laughs> oh, my God. Why don't you step into my rowboat and we'll have a break. Okay, here we are halfway through. We have ourselves another five-star review. Oh, my goodness. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. I'll sit back down. Th thank you. Thank you. I'm not wearing a life vest. Forgot the first rule of rowboats. Don't jump up and down. Nick, a review? That's fantastic. That is right. This is from Slick Tumic. Great. I'll paddle away from the reeds while you read. Perfect. Away from the paddles. The review is entitled, Glad to Hear You Talking About Tull. <laughs> Started late to the show and enjoying it very much. My introduction to Jethro Tull was a review of Thick as a Brick and our high school newspaper. Wow. I was hooked from there. This was 1972, so yes, I'm a boomer that listens to podcasts. Just recently heard your review of Sun, and was curious why there was no reference to the line of 10 days for watching the sunset. Enjoy the podcast very much, and I'm looking forward to my favorite albums, Aqualung to A, plus the ones that follow. Steve. Well, Steve, it's a pleasure to be amongst ye, and to have you here as part of the, the other part of the brain. Your uniqueness shall be added to our collective resistance is futile. 
I believe 10 days for watching the sunset is what? You're grounded for 10 days probably for staying out late past your curfew. Yeah, uh, yeah, 10 days for watching the sunset. Yeah, that sounds like being grounded or having um, having privileges taken away. Watching the sunset is staying out late or maybe it's a euphemism for something else. That's true. Could be. Who knows? When I was your age, amusement we made for ourselves. Ten days for watching the sunset. When I was your age, amusement we made for ourselves. Well, what's watching the sunset? That's making amusement for yourself. Right. Come on, Dad. Come on, Granddad. Get with it. But it's like, I'm punishing you for doing exactly what I did when I was your age. <laughs> that feels right, though. It feels right for the song, yeah. Yeah. Permission yeah. to breathe, sir? Don't talk like that, I'm your old man. Permission to breathe, sir. Don't talk like that, I'm your old man. God, I love, I love that song. It's so good. That whole gosh darn album, so good. Steve, thank you for jackknifing our minds all the way back to benefit. I hope that you continue to listen. I hope you can continue to enjoy, and I hope that we can convince you to stick around as we move on to the other post-A albums. <laughs> That's right. That's all we've got left, so please bear with us. And thank you, everybody else. We encourage, as you know, at the end of every episode, we encourage writing in for reviews. We appreciate it so very much. I also just want to say, what a unique jump start. Oh, yeah. Reviewing a tall album for a high school newspaper, that breaks the mold. That's yeah. really cool. Absolutely. That is a very, very unique jump start. Greatly appreciate that one. Awesome. Thank you. You've run the robo to ground. Let's get out our wellies and, uh, and wade over to shore. And we'll get away from here before the owner of the rowboat shows up. <gasps> All right, Omen. Talk to me about Koronok. Holy mamoli, Nick. Is it more than just the British version of America the Beautiful? Girl, yes. Is it more than a jingoistic nationalistic rag to make you think that the place you live in is a flawless gem nestled amidst the particularly ripe turds of the rest of the world's countries? Yes, it is. Okay. It is more than that. Cool. What I believe it is, is a, a lament for how wonderful the country could have been if mm. it were not for certain societal and political factors. Omen, why do you think that? Nick, I'm glad you asked. Please tell me. Throwing my voice over there. If you, if you read through the lyrics, Gray the mist, cold the dawn, cruel the sea and stern the shore, brave the man who sets his course for Albion. Break the mist, fall the dawn. Crew out the sea and stir the shore. Break the man who sets his course for I'll be on. First of all, what's Albion? Oh gosh, Albion was fantasy perfect land in the King Arthur myth? Is that right? Ah, I think that probably there is a reference somewhere in there, maybe to, what is it, the Maid of the Mist, the Mist of Avalon? Oh, Avalon. I was thinking of Avalon. Okay. But but you're not far off. Albion okay. is derived from a, a Greek word passed through Latin, which means white. Yep. And Albion is an old term for England. It's, it's probably oh. what the Romans called England. Because when they were coming at it, they would have the first thing they would have seen was the cliffs of Dover, which are chalk white. Also appropriate because don't know if you know this, but in England there are an awful lot of white people. And then later on it began to refer to a specific part of the British Isles, which is some at some dividing line north. So Okay. Britain, but Britain as defined by north of this spot, including most of Scotland. So there's a little bit of a connection there with our Scottish front man. Okay. Sweet the rose, sharp the thorn, meek the soil and proud the corn. Bless the lamb that would be born within this green and pleasant land. Sweet the rose, sharp the thorn, meek the 
starts to remind me of a speech, another set of texts. No doubt you are familiar with Richard II, Act 2, Scene 1, The Death of John of Gaunt. I refer to him as Dick Dose, but yeah, yeah, I am. So John Gaunt has arguably the best speech in the play, or the most memorable speech in the play, and it is an ode to England. Okay. And it's very easy to take it out of context and to read... This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. You can see the similarities. He or any row. <laughs> he or any, oh no, she better, wrote. <laughs> There's references within Dee's lyrics in, in the way that she's describing England. But this speech, in its context, is not just John of Gaunt saying, wow, England's freaking great. It's him saying on his deathbed, after having given his, really his whole life in loyalty to the crown, and now the crown being taken over by this freaking dweeb who's making all these terrible mistakes and being an idiot and banishing his own son, banishing Gaunt's son, for no reason at all. Gaunt is saying, you know what? I've been nice this entire time. I'm one of the old guard who's always supported the royalty. Mask off. It's about to get real. And he's essentially saying, this is England. England is amazing. And Ah. it has been sold out. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it. Like a tenement or pelting farm. Ooh. England, bound in with the triumphant sea, whose rocky shores beat back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blot and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, would the scandal vanish with my life. So it's by virtue of comparing this song to that piece, you're saying the song is more a lamentation, really, and being applied to, therefore, the program about England. It's almost a a the good old days kind of thing, and and where did we go wrong? It's hard to know what the context of the program was. I mean, if this had been England throughout the ages or the history of Britain, there's lots of points where you could put this kind of lament to all the armies who died, all all the terrible things that happened, trying to, you know, move the country from one form of rule to another and there was a lot of that there was a lot of going back and forth between the houses and a lot of unnecessary bloodshed that's sort of the plot of of richard the second idiot takes over a lot of unnecessary bloodshed happens good king takes over from that good king wenceslas actually right he's lost his fucking mind oh (laughs) so in that context i think what you know between the title meaning a traditional lament Uh uh-huh between the Hirani Rose, Hirani O's, which is which is imbued with the spirit of lamentation. Yeah, the keening, yeah. I think that we have a, what a lament we have here for something that the writer holds so dear. Hmm. Yeah. I just had the thought, a lot of like old... English folk songs have those those nonsensical lines as well, you know, like "Wayfi diddly ido," you know, like. But I, I I think it's too it's too close to the keening thing to not be that. Yes. Also, a lot of those traditional fiddly diddly dums are actually kind of hidden other languages. Mm, okay. Where Gaelic was banned, and so oh. you couldn't say something in Gaelic, but you could hide it by making it sound like nonsense. Interesting. And then ages pass, and we we retain the nonsense and none of the meaning. Right. That's America, actually. That's We've kept the nonsense, but none of the meaning, exactly. And it's possible to think that Dee, writing in the mid-'80s, at the height of Reaganomics, at the height of all these massive cultural, industrial, societal changes that were going on, and Dee having been involved with the band when they were really 
looking at their roots as uh, their cultural roots as Britons. Maybe there was this sense of, wow, you know, I had to research this series about about the history of England and, and where are we now? And Thatcher was in the 80s, so... Thatcher was all over the 80s. She's, boy, boy, they had to beat her off with a stick. I mean, beat her back with a stick. What? That, that stick sold for $10,000 at Christie's. You know, Steve Jobs worn down Birkenstocks yes, just I sold saw that. for like $120,000 or something. Uh-huh. What's wrong with humans, Omen? Presumably all, all that money went to charity, right? Right, Nick? Right. I have Tell my doubts. I have my doubts. <laughs> the sandals went to charity. Right. They ate the sandals. Charitably. With a nice Chianti. With the wind from the east came the first of those who tread upon this stone, this throne of kings, this realm, this new Jerusalem. With the wind from the east came the first of those that tread upon this stone, this throne of kings, this realm, this new Jerusalem. That's it. He or Ronnie Rowe the rest of the way in the heavy metal breakdown, and Bob's your uncle. No, and you can call me crazy. I have. For making the comparison between this song and that John Gaunt speech. But if you look at very specific lines, within this fortress nature built to stay the hand of war, that's Dee Palmer. This fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, that's Billy Shakes. Yeah, I definitely see the parallel. And we don't know for sure if D is a scholar of the Bard, but... No doubt. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. This royal throne of kings, this scepter dial. There we have the Shakespeare. So, I mean, that that's where it's like, it's too similar, in my mind, to be accidental or even referential without being aware. Yeah. For me, this is D. Palmer was like, oh, what if we turned that John Gaunt speech into a pimp-ass prog rock song with an oboe? And if you can't get an oboe, get a clarinet. <laughs> and maybe the context of the speech itself didn't get translated over. Maybe because John is talking about how beautiful and lovely and amazing England was, D takes that out of context, out of time, and puts it in and says how beautiful it is. And that is a very common thing to be done with this speech. This speech is all is often cherry-picked to say... Ooh, yes, England, how lovely. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, the original intent of it is, y'all had a good thing going, and you messed it up. Yeah, you voided the warranty. Almost literally, yes. But I suspect that, again, going back to Koranach, the word, and the mournful tone of the song, I suspect that D translated part of the speech into lyrics and part of the speech into music mm. and wrapped it up in a string bow and served it to us as a Christmas pudding. As she do. And the BBC, whatever they paid her and whatever they paid Tall, should have doubled it. Generally a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Yeah. Double it, add a tin of biscuits. <sighs> and then ask the feckless moms if they want to do a podcast about it. Ask not what you can do for England. Ask what the feckless moms can do for you. For you. <laughs> <laughs> Omen, next week you must be dancing out of your pants for this one. You must know what we're discussing next week. Omen, what are we discussing next week? Next week we are talking about Crest of a Knave. And what is the first track off of Crest of a Knave? Steel Kamunky. <laughs> the K is silent on that one. I am so excited to talk about Steel Monkey next week. Until next week, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee, I'm Omen Said. I am a fortress nature-built Nick McGill. From Eagle Mountains born, we are the Feckless Momes. And this is the blessed lamb that would be born within the green and pleasant land. Talk tell to me. <laughs> In the
the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre in stubborn jewelry of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out, I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm, England bound in with the triumphant sea whose rocky shores beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame, with inky blot and rotten parchment bonds that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. How would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death if talk tall to me were a proud member of the Feckless Momes audio network. You're any road.